Hello, this is John Gammon, and this is Server Load Balancer 201, Introduction to Basic Concepts and Terminology. The first thing I want to cover is HTML rewrite, which is, includes HTTP to HTTPS, which is a feature of NSX. And also I'm going to briefly cover F5I rules, not completely, but just some of the basic concepts of that. I rules obviously do a lot more than rewrite, but that's one of the uses. So back to my diagram here. Let's talk about a page and how it's rendered. So in HTTP or HTTPS, when a page is requested, the page that's requested is typically something like an ASP, a JSP, a PHP, something like that. And we call this the container page. The container page, when it's requested, gets sent to the, to the web server and depending on what the extension is, it's going to send that to an application server back here to generate the content. And the application server is going to hit the database to go pull content and it's going to render HTML. Okay? And HTML is ultimately what gets sent back to the client. And then the browser knows how to render HTML. But one of the key concepts here is that what's inside the HTML is not only content like text, but you've also got a lot of links. And as the browser goes through and renders the page, when it hits a link, it's going to put something in that spot. So let's say it hits an image link or a JavaScript link. It's going to embed that into the page but this is going to be another request so when it's as it renders this page it's going to be going out and making a bunch of requests to the um, to the load balancer and then ultimately to this to the end server so these links that are in here let's say it's an image link it's let's say in the page I've got HTTP colon slash slash and then I've got some image and the browser sees that and goes and makes a request and then renders that into the page or maybe it's JavaScript that's getting it's getting pulled into the page here and these are all separate HTTP requests that get sent out and so a single page may be 20 30 40 different requests that come into the application or into the the server farm here and one of the common things is Let's say a customer has a bunch of links embedded into their page that are HTTP and they, um, for whatever reason, they, they hard coded that into the page and they decide later that they want this application to be HTTPS and they want it to be encrypted. Well, what happens is they would have to go back into the application possibly change some of the coding or scripting or maybe just page, change all the templates. It may be kind of a mess because they've got different hard-coded links. Maybe some of them are in the database. Some of them are in the, the templates of the pages. And so there's, it's maybe just a complete nightmare for them to go in and make that change in the application itself because maybe it's, it's all over the map as to where they've, they've got those hard-coded links. And, and they estimate it would cost us you know, three hundred thousand dollars to hire a develop, you know, a group of developers to go make all these changes. So one of the key concepts of load balancing is the fact that because I'm sitting in the path, so I've obviously got connections coming in and then back out, and I've got this device here that's sitting in the middle that sees everything coming in and it sees everything going out. Well, what if I just did some scripting here or made some changes inside the load balancer that affected or rewrote things in the payload or rewrote things in the header or made decisions on how to load balance traffic intelligently and so that's the idea of you know application delivery and those types of concepts is we can we're looking at layer 7 we're looking at the HTML and the HTTP headers and all that and we can insert things and we can rewrite things so a simple example is if what's coming back from the 
web server is an HTML with a bunch of links that are HTTP, it's pretty easy for me just to say, all right, everything that comes back from these web servers, I'm going to rewrite. And I'm just going to simply change HTTP to HTTPS. So all those image links and JavaScript links and links to other pages that are embedded into the page are all going to be rewritten from HTTP to HTTPS. And I didn't have to go in and change all the things in the application. I just in one spot put a, a simple change in here um, to do that. And that's one of the really powerful things that a load balancer will be able to do. And um, and so, you know, when the browser now sees that page, it's got all those HTTP uh, colon slash slash links, and when the, and, and the subsequent requests will all be sent SSL and, and HTTPS uh, to port 443 on the load balancer. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is F5I rules, and that obviously takes this whole rewrite concept to the next level. And we talked about how a load balancer, because it sits in the path of the traffic is able to do things to that traffic and what iRules does is take that concept and put scripting around it so I can literally manipulate that traffic coming to or from the web server or to or from the client however I want I can go insert headers I can modify headers I can insert content I can modify content from the actual HTML itself. So any links that are in there, any content coming from the page can be modified. I can literally do anything I want with that traffic. And what you see at customers is, as their application has evolved over many years, things have come up where they need to make some kind of change to the, to the application. And at some point, someone decided, hey, Instead of going and changing the application itself, what if we just made the change on the load balancer with an iRule? And so the evolution of that is that over a period of time, you have customers with 20, 30, 40 different scripts that are doing different things to different pages in the application. And that really gives very nice vendor lock-in for F5 because now they're tied very closely to the application and if a customer was going to rip out F5, they would literally be left with applications that didn't work. And the, the complexity of going back and making those changes in the application would be nearly impossible. So just something to keep in mind when you're talking to customers that have uh, F5 in their environment, just keep that in mind. That's something I had to deal with quite a bit when I sold uh, Ace. So. Next thing I want to do is just give a couple of examples of some I rules, just to kind of illustrate it. And I'm sure there's much better examples that other people on the team can give you, but there's just a couple of the ones I can think of off the top of my head. So one would be, you know, as an example, let's say that's what's coming back from this web server has a bunch of image links. So in the HTML, it's being sent to the client. Um, there's links in here, and these and, and these links may be images that are mainserver.com. Okay, and what I mean by that is the link itself, when the when the browser is rendering it and it hits it, it's going to send the request for the image to the same VIP that the main page was being sent from so this HTML so I requested the ASP container and it went to this server it's going to send the request for the the PNG file or whatever back to that same main server does that make sense so let's say that you know as my application evolved I decided that I wanted to have a separate pool just for images I may call that like image pool and I want to have a separate VIP over here that's just for images. And instead of going to mainserver.com, I want to go to imageserver.com or something like that, slash image. And then that will resolve DNS to a different uh, VIP. Traffic will come into my separate uh, image VIP, and then that'll be load balanced to my image pool. Now, 
because what's coming back again from the web server is HTML, it's got all these hard-coded links in there. If I want to go make that change from mainserver.com to, to imageserver.com, I would have to go change the application. I'd have to go change templates. Maybe in, in you know the scenario is all these links are hard coded at different parts of the application. Maybe some of the links are in the database, some of them are in the application server, some of them are in the templates. And so to make that change would be very complicated and time consuming. So hey, you know, customer decides, all right, for now we'll go make it an I rule and then they never go back and, and, and really change the application like they maybe plan to do. So that's one example. You know, I could easily write a an I rule that would just say every time I see mainserver.com change it to imageserver.com for maybe certain types of links like if it's a PH uh, you know not or maybe it's a PNG or a JPEG I go change those links but everything else I leave the same that would be a, a kind of a complex rule or not so complex but you get the idea another example of you know where you want to use I rules is when you're dealing with the HTTP headers so when traffic gets sent back or you know to or from the client HTTP is really a combination of headers and also payload which is going to be your image or your HTML or whatever that's going to be the payload but there's always headers associated with it and you know if it's returning an image the header will tell it how long to cache that image it'll also tell it if the payload is going to be compressed or not so does the browser um, you know if, if, if the server compresses it it tells the browser hey I gzip compress this in the header and then the browser knows how to pull that out of the, the zip so the headers are very important and, and things like it, it, one of the headers may be not to cache something so maybe there's uh, a no cache in the header and so what I could do is go in and modify things in the header so I could change the way things are being sent back how I could change the cache time to live for example maybe if the cache time to live is hard coded in my application and I want to modify that I could just modify it at the load balancer so that's another good example. The other thing I'll just mention briefly, and I don't have a lot of experience in this area, but you know you can modify the way things are load balanced to the pool via iRules. So maybe you want certain uh, pages that contain certain things or certain things that are embedded into the URI. Maybe you always want those to go to a particular server on the back end here um, you know one example off the top of my head is maybe if there's something in the header or the URI that means that that user is at a elite status or something maybe you have a, an eye rule that just always sends them to a, a special server just for that user I mean just things like that you can kind of use your imagination but but the idea of eye rules is complete power over everything coming to and from the web to and from the web server to and from the client and being able to modify that any way we want. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is application firewall. So this is something that a lot of uh, very advanced load balancers have built in. Ace had it, as well as F5 and so forth. And what this is, it is a firewall in a sense, but it's different from a traditional Firewall, and I think of it when I think of a traditional firewall, I think of it as operating at layer two through four, typically. So I can put in rules to block things from layer two, like maybe block a protocol from being able to be placed on layer two. I could block a particular IP address via an ACL, or I could obviously drop or block ports. Um, but the problem is if I'm letting port 80 into my web application then people can do things to that web application so um, so basically what I mean by that is in in a web application for example you're gonna have form fields 
So you have like name, and then you, they're going to enter information and, and address and so forth. And what what hackers do is they go in to the name field and they insert scripts into there, or they insert database command SQL into the actual form field, and the application then takes that script or that SQL back into the application. So, so basically they, they sent a form field to the web server. The web server then passes that to the app server and then maybe that gets passed down to the database and because of the way they've structured this that they put into the actual form field it does something on the app server. Maybe it runs some kind of script when the app server then loads that field into its code and brings it in, it maybe runs something on the app server, or maybe when the database brings that field into the database, that SQL that was put into the form field does something on the database. And so literally hackers can go in, even though they're just sending HTTP or HTTPS to and from the web server, they're able to make exploits into that just by putting things into the field or maybe manipulating headers and things like that. So the idea of an application firewall is that you need to be able to look into the layer 7 payload and block things. And what a, what a application firewall will typically do, and you run this on the load balancer let's say, is it just runs regular expressions against everything in a form field, or basically everything coming into the the load balancer from the client, it actually runs a regex against it and looks for SQL and looks for scripting commands and things like that and if it sees that it will either block that or flag it and, and notify someone that somebody's entering in. And if you look, um, if you go out and read about okay somebody broke into Sony and stole all the credit card numbers it's amazing how often you'll see it's a SQL injection or a script injection or something like that, cross-site scripting. And those are very common exploits. And so an application firewall will just will basically look for any SQL or scripting commands and then immediately flag that and block it at the application layer. So even though I'm letting port 80 in, I can I can block that traffic. The other thing it'll do is is look at content coming back from the web server and block certain things. So let's say I know uh, driver's license numbers have a certain format. Social security numbers have a certain format and credit card numbers have certain formats. And if it sees anything for any reason being pulled however it was done, so maybe some kind of exploit was done but it sees something coming back from the web server with these, so it's run, again running regex against these and it says okay if I see any of these sequences of numbers that look like any of these you know driver's license or social security or credit card it's gonna block those. So again you know application firewall at a very high level I know it's not a lot of depth here but you're parsing information to and from the web server and from the client at port, you know, uh, at the layer seven, looking into the payload, looking into the headers, into those form fields, and if you see certain things that shouldn't be there, then you immediately block it. All right, all right. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, I want to talk about uh, global server load balancing, and this is a pretty fairly complex topic but I'm going to basically just kind of scratch the surface and give you what I know about it because I, I did spend some time s selling GSS which was Cisco's global server load balancer um, so let me let me clear the slate here to talk about GSLB but essentially it's good to understand before you dive into GSLB you have to really understand how DNS works and DNS at a high level, in my mind, the way I think of it is it's, it's delegates things. So it's, it's all about delegation. 
And as an example, let's say I've got a site out and it's being hosted by, um, so I've got a website being hosted by uh, webfaction.com. Now webfaction, because it's hosting me, has a bunch of DNS servers that are authoritative for my domain. So let's say that I've got a website on mydomain.com and I've got a bunch of subdomains maybe like videos.mydomain.com and images.mydomain.com. Ultimately, the, the web faction DNS servers are the ones that are answering those DNS requests. So they're actually um, so they're the ones that are actually sending back the IP address for that website. But they're not the ones that I have. So I I have webfaction.com, but I don't have my domain actually registered with them. My domain is registered, let's say, with GoDaddy. And GoDaddy has a bunch of DNS servers. And what happens is when a request comes into GoDaddy and they say, okay, I want to get, I want to um, find out what the IP address is for mydomain.com, GoDaddy is not authoritative for that domain name. It simply has what's called an NS record or NS records multiple. And when that request comes in, it sends that, forwards it to one of these other name servers via that list of NS records that it has. And the NS record will answer the client request for that particular subdomain or that particular domain name, mydomain.com. So basically, it came into GoDaddy, GoDaddy just forwarded it. And whatever the first name server to respond is, is what the client will will use. So on the client side, they have a list of name servers that they're using and that is typically hitting the ISP. Okay, and then the ISP is going out to the .com and that's delegating to GoDaddy and that's delegating to WebFaction. Now, one thing is there's a concept of caching so DNS caches, that's very important. So when my browser gets the IP address on my client here, let's say Internet Explorer, when it gets the IP address for mydomain.com, the browser caches it. When the ISP domain name server gets the IP address for mydomain.com, it caches it. .com caches the request to GoDaddy. GoDaddy caches the request to WebFaction and then WebFaction is returning the IP address and then all these things are caching it along the way. So that's something to keep in mind when you talk about using DNS because even if I change, let's say I go into WebFaction and I modify how I want to answer that domain name request at WebFaction, it has to propagate that all through these caches and it may take you know 30 minutes before when I let's say I change my web faction to point mydomain.com to a different link right inside my my uh, hosting provider so I change it to like a different folder or something I have to wait 30 minutes for that to, to change to show up on the actual web browser so that's something to keep in mind with with um, with GSLB but essentially what we do with GSLB is we create a DNS server and a DNS server usually is just dumb. It, it basically has a, a, a record and it says this name so mydomain.com returns this IP address. So if this thing is kind of like dumb, it just it doesn't have any intelligence behind it. It, it just returns it. and. Um, you, again, you could put in NS records, and an NS record would just forward or delegate to another server. Um, and so that's essentially how you would configure something like bind to return uh, IP addresses. But what we do with a, um, in the case of a global server load balancer is 
you're doing it's it's DNS and it's authoritative again. So it's like that web faction server that's authoritative, but it is actually intelligently probing VIPs and making decisions um, to before it returns the IP address. So so basically something's going to get delegated down to this, let's say from GoDaddy or whatever via an NS record, when it gets to the GSLB, the GSLB is going to return a IP address, but before it does that, it's going to intelligently look at what's happening in the network. So let's say this is data center one, this is data center two, um, then um, these are different VIPs. So let's say I've got a bunch of applications running behind a VIP and this is active. All right, and this is standby. The GSLB is probing those VIPs, and if it sees that this VIP is not responding, and the probes again could be something like an HTTP GET, or it could be something that I parse, or it could be scripts that I'm running, similar to you know your regular load balancing health checking. So I'm doing these probes against the VIP itself, and if that VIP doesn't answer, then I'm going to start returning the IP address of data center two and I'm going to start thereby directing clients to my other data center. So that's kind of the concept of a GSLB is now we're intelligently returning whatever is authoritative for that domain name is returning the IP address. We're going to intelligently probe before we send back an IP address. And you could also look at it, um, you know, the other thing a low bound, uh, GSLB could do is it could say I want to send 70 percent of my traffic here and 30% here, and so it could actually return uh, different IP addresses uh, depending on you know how it wants to distribute the load. Or you could say I want to return this data center until it gets to what I consider to be 90%, and then at that point I want to start returning data center two until this one gets down below 70%. So you can get pretty creative in how you basically answer DNS requests to kind of distribute the traffic between two data centers or just do a simple act of standby. Um, the one thing you got to keep in mind though is like I said because things are being cached when I make that failover so when I fail over from let's say data center one goes down and I fail over to data center two it's still going to take some time for that to propagate through the caches on the DNS so one thing you can do is adjust the time to live on the DNS uh, responses and tr and a lot of times they may or may not honor that TTL but you want to set that low so that they uh, it checks quite often for new updates to the IP the other thing though is that the reason why it's still an advantage it's because let's say the the data center one goes down at uh, you know 2 a.m. in the morning and Everybody gets paged that the data center's down. Well, at least that process of failing over has started immediately. So let's say like, you know, data center one went down, it failed five probes. Uh, the GSLB immediately flipped, started answering data center two. And everybody gets paged, comes in, and, and 30 minutes later, everybody logs in to check, and the application's back up automatically. And even though that took some time to fail over, it would have taken even longer if we had waited for someone to go manually make that change to DNS. So, um, again, so it gives you the power. The GSLB basically is giving you the capability of um, being able to make intelligent choices and do it automatically so it, it's done faster.